Premier, welcome back to the show. Hi, David. I, I want to start with the tax cut you announced last night that you're delaying. This was a central promise from your election while rebuilding your heritage fund to the extent that you announced last night was not. So how do you justify this shift to people who voted for you and this tax cut just last year? Well, the tax cut will be delivered in this mandate. I would uh, love to be able to implement everything within the first year, but sometimes things need to be staged. And we, we have to look at what is happening on the international stage with oil and gas prices. I have to look at what is happening as well, quite frankly, with the refinancing of our debt, which $26 billion comes due over the next three years at higher rates. It's going to increase our finance charges. And we want to make sure that when we deliver the tax cut, that it is sustainable and that we're not going to go into deficit. So my finance minister raised a few alarm bells, and we uh, just feel like we should need to take a, an extra year to be able to implement it with a level of comfort. When it comes to the Heritage Savings Trust Fund, we started down this path a couple of years ago. We uh, announced in our last budget that we were going to be reinvesting all of the investment income in the fund. And now uh, when we get surplus revenue, windfall revenue at the end of the year, one-time revenue, we have an opportunity to put it towards debt, towards savings, and towards one-time spending. That, that came from last year. We're just charting out a pathway for how we can get to 250 to 400 billion by 2050. And but I'm hoping people are excited about the potential. I, I've seen some commentary, though, calling this a, a bait and switch or even a, a broken promise. So how do you respond to that? No, it will be delivered in in our mandate, and we'll put out the the formula and the the time schedule for how that will be implemented. But we have to be able to do two things at once. I mean, on the on the issue of spending increases, operational spending increases, as well as tax cuts, that impacts your budget every single year. When it comes to windfall revenues, that's really up to what the market does on oil and gas prices. So we have to have a different strategy to how we manage the the windfall. So we're we're going to be pursuing both strategies and just make sure that we're doing it in a way that uh, doesn't put us into deficit. Remember, that was our number one promise, is that we wouldn't go back into deficit. And so if it takes a little bit of pacing to make sure that we've got the, the balance right, then I think Albertans will understand. But, uh, Premier, your current budget and, and your mid-year fiscal update both project surpluses uh, for the current year and for the next several years. So, so if you can't deliver you know, a key election promise like a tax cut while you have surpluses on the books and projected in future years, I mean, what guarantee is there you're going to be able to do it next year, given all the other factors you've just outlined? Well, the whole point of putting forward a long-term savings plan is that we can't keep relying on natural resource revenue spikes to bail us out. We were fortunate this year. I mean, the revenue the surplus that we have was because oil for several months out of the year was above $90 per barrel. Well, it's been as, as below $70 per barrel as well. And to, to do a long-term um, revenue cut to taxes on the basis of those kind of volatile streams. It's just not a responsible thing to do. So part of what we're doing is we're increasing our spending at a, a more measured rate so that our revenues will grow faster than our expenditures so that we can afford those tax cuts. And then in the long run, once we start putting significant dollars and see the significant compound interest on that fund, that will ultimately become an avenue for us to replace resource revenues into the future. And so I'm, I'm just asking for Albertans to have a little bit of commitment so that we can do what we have never been able to do before, which is to, to make sure that we've got that horizon of, of 25 years and all of the benefit that will come from just a little bit of discipline today. So you told the province there would be a pause on this, but there wouldn't be any cuts in the next budget. But the Health Sciences Association of Alberta, which is one of your health care unions, uh, it's issued a statement saying that Alberta Health Services is, is canceling recruitment for frontline health professionals as part of a hiring freeze to deal with an operating deficit. Well, why is this happening in an important sector like health care if you don't need to make cuts? Look, here's the problem that we have in healthcare. We have a large number of our staff that have been burnt out because of the the, the way uh, that AHS has managed it over the last number of years. We're trying to stabilize that and encourage more people to stay in the system and to work full time. And that's part of the, um, the the approach that we're taking. We are recruiting more doctors and creating a new model to fund our doctors and our nurse practitioners so we can take more pressure off of our acute care hospitals. We, we can't continue at this rate where our hospitals are constantly operating at 105%. And we're, we're seeing that is the most expensive door to go into. We have to start building out the other parts of the system. That's what we're doing. And we are not cutting. Uh, we are slowing the rate of increase to a level that we believe is going to be sustainable. It's still a spending increase. We know that as a growing province, we have to make sure that we're keeping up with schools, hospital, roads, as well as doctors, nurses, and teachers. So I, I think people will understand that we can prioritize health 
and education and social services, as well as having the future in mind with a with a long term sustainable plan to end this roller coaster of resource revenue. Right, but but the union says you're canceling recruitment for frontline health professionals, presumably vacancies no. that are not going to be filled, and there's a hiring freeze. So no. so how how does that stabilize things? No, I mean, what we have said is try to find a way to reduce the amount of overtime and try to find a way to reduce the amount of agency nurses. And I can tell you, every single premier is quite concerned about agency nurses. I think I read an article on CBC, in fact, mm -hmm. that agency nurses charge up to $300 per hour. And that is not a sustainable way for us to be managing our healthcare system by having a, a bunch of extra overtime payment, which pays a double time or having a bunch of part-time uh, agency nurses, was, which is triple or quadruple time. So those are things that we're looking at, absolutely, because we want to offer long-term, sustainable, full-time jobs to our frontline staff. So, so there is no hiring freeze at Alberta Health Services? There is no recruitment being canceled? Is that what are, you're saying? We have, always told, we have always told our frontline that, uh, that we are going to make sure that that is where the investment is. What we're, we're concerned about is the level of managers, managing managers, managing managers. We have heard all kinds of stories about how decisions don't get made on the front line because there's seven layers of decision makers to go through. That's where we're focusing our effort is on streamlining at the management layers, not the front line. Okay, you've told your finance minister to keep spending below the rate of inflation plus population growth. And and, and I know that's not technically a cut, but it is a level of restraint that, that people say will keep services below levels that you need because the spending needs to rise uh, to match inflation, to match population growth. So is that not a way that it will lead to deferred maintenance in schools, in hospitals, delayed hirings, delayed uh, investment in roads? I mean, is that what Albertans should expect over this period of restraint? No. No, they shouldn't expect that at all. What they should expect is that we're going to make sure that the tax dollars that we do have the privilege of spending on their behalf are spent properly. And when you look at how much it costs to have somebody in an acute care bed in a hospital, that's $1,500 per day. And what we've di recently discovered is that there's 1,500 people in acute care beds who should be in some other alternative level of care, whether it's for mental health, addictions, homelessness, rental housing, or long-term care. And, and that is a far more cost-effective way for us to be treating those individuals and giving them better care. So uh, it's up to us to find those efficiencies. And I, I think that the, the problem is that there's just been a lack of diligence on the management side. It's part of the reason we're taking a hands-on approach so that we can get the right patient in the right place, getting the right level of treatment. And, and that is going to be surgical work that needs to be done, but it's going to result in better care. And it's also, um, it's also going to make sure that we're not um, using our resources, our most expensive resources, inappropriately. But, but more broadly, across all of government beyond healthcare, if, if you stay below the rate of inflation and, and don't match population growth, you're going to lose ground against the demand uh, for services, for, for basic infrastructure and, and for schools. Is that not what is potentially going to happen in Alberta? Well, look, we have to increase our spending in line with our increases in our revenue. And if our revenue is not increasing uh, at, at inflation and population growth, then, then we can't increase our, our spending faster than that. So we have to keep an eye on both of those things to make sure that we're sustainable. Uh, I know that it's fashionable for other governments to, to run unending deficits with no end in sight. I mean, just look at the federal government. They're, they, they've racked up more debt in the last few years than we had in our entire history. That's not what we do in Alberta, because we recognize that families also have a household budget. Families also save. They also have to put money aside for debt, and they also have to manage their, their expenses. And we want to set a good example that we're prepared to do the same kind of hard work that, uh, that Alberta families have to do as well. Right. Well, the federal government took on a lot of that debt to deal with the pandemic, and, and so that provinces and municipalities didn't have to. But, but that's, that's another conversation. Uh, the other, the long-term strategic goal you spelled out last night was, was essentially of weaning the province off of its reliability on volatile non-renewable revenues because uh, of the ups and downs uh, of oil and gas revenues. Doesn't that suggest that your moratorium that you put in place on renewable projects was a mistake and, and that the fight against some of the green transition measures is maybe a little bit misguided because this is precisely uh, part of what those issues are, are trying to deal with? Anyone who looks at an electricity system knows that you need dispatchable baseload power. And there is a role for solar and wind, but solar is not dispatchable and neither is wind. When you get to minus 35 on a January 13th day at five o'clock at night and wind isn't blowing and sun isn't shining, you need to have base load power to be, make sure your lights stay on. And we, we experienced that exact circumstance just a few weeks ago. So uh, when we bring solar and wind back on, and we will be lifting the pause next week as, as we promised, we are going to bring it on in a way that makes sure 
that we also have the, the backup so that whether it's plus 35 or minus 35, we're going to be able to make sure that people have secure, reliable power. Right. But was the moratorium a mistake? Because it, money could have been Cross invested number. and things could have been built to start, you know, uh, generating some of the revenue no. stability beyond this, right? Look, look, David, if the sun doesn't blow and the wind doesn't shine, it doesn't matter if I have 100,000 megawatts of it. We, we have to make sure that we're bringing on a responsible amount of solar and wind so that we always have dispatchable power. Dispatchable power, things like nuclear and hydroelectric, geothermal mm. and, and natural gas. That's got to be the, the basis for how we build our system. And then solar and wind can augment. But I know that there's been this fantasy that's been pushed by the current environment minister that an industrial economy like Cars can run off wind and solar and battery power. It can't. Batteries only last an hour. And I just can't tell people, sorry, the sun's going to come, uh, come up at 9 a.m. in the morning. Just uh, make do in the middle. So, no, the, the, the renewables pause was absolutely essential for us to make sure that we got the, the uh, fundamentals right. Speaking of the federal government, you called the federal government delusional adversaries in your address last night, the same day you criticized the prime minister for coming to Edmonton for a housing announcement and, and not talking to you. How, how does any of that help things, improve things, help Albertans? I've been very clear that uh, Stephen Gibault is uh, an ideological environment minister who has demonstrated zero interest in cooperative federalism and working with us. We have tried over the last year to be at the table so that we could align our objectives to a carbon neutrality by 2050. We're going to continue doing that. But every time we think we're making progress, we get some insane announcement coming from Gibault. And I think people now see that I've been acknowledging for the last year that the things he wants to achieve are not achievable. Like everyone knows we can't stop building roads. And these are the kind of pronouncements he makes all the time. And then he has, I guess on this one, he had enough pushback, he had to walk it back. But it's just as ludicrous to propose a net zero power grid by 2035. It's just as ludicrous to put an emissions cap on our industry by 2030. And so all of these are a demonstration, I think, of a lack of cooperative federalism. And it is delusional to think that you can achieve things when the technology is not there to achieve them in such a short time frame. 2050, we are on board with working the federal government on that. But we, we certainly cannot pretend that we're going to be able to achieve some of the unachievable pipe dreams that the, that the federal ministers put forward. Well, the announcement by the prime minister on housing yesterday, Edmonton, I don't know if that would fit into the ludicrous category. And his office says they gave your office a heads up the day before that he would be in Edmonton. Were you given the heads up? Did you request a meeting with the prime minister when given notice? Hmm. Do you think that's how he uh, gave Doug Ford the heads up when they did a joint press conference or Wab Canoe when they did a joint press conference or David Eby when they did a joint press conference? He sent a text six hours before and said, oh, by the way, we'll be here. That's not an appropriate way to arrange a meeting or to, to demonstrate that you actually want to have a partnership. I Absolutely, I would meet with him if he gave enough time, called my office, and we were able to set, a, set, a, set aside some time. I, I found his approach very immature and unprofessional. And I called him out on it. So next time he comes to the province, he knows I'm quite happy to have a meeting, but I need more than six hours notice. Okay, so it wasn't 24 hours notice. It was six hours notice. That's what you're saying. That's how, how your office found that's out? What, that's what I'm told. That's what I'm told by the one person who said, by the way, we'll be in Edmonton. That's it. Okay, so will you try to set up a meeting with the prime minister in the near future? I, I just, like, you are right. He has had news conferences with other premiers, and he has not had one with you, uh, presumably, or even a meeting with you, uh, as you're pointing out, uh, in, in this particular time period. Will you try to set one up? Do you think it's possible and, and worthwhile, given the state of relations with you Look, the prime minister? I can only tell you what I do. When, when I went to Ottawa to open our office, I put out a request to meet with Minister Champagne, Minister LeBlanc, um, uh, uh, Minister Wilkinson, um, as well as uh, 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 Minister Seamus O'Regan, because those are the four ministers who are on top of the files that are most important to me. And I did have a meeting with Minister Wilkinson. It was very productive and, uh, and, and worthwhile. The others weren't uh, able to make it work. I think it was when the big snowstorm happened, and so mm. it interfered with their, with their schedule. But I gave them several days I think even two weeks notice that I was coming, that this just sort of basic professional courtesy. And so, yes, I mean, I'm, I'm always happy to, to meet with our federal counterparts to talk about areas of common ground, but I, I just, I won't tolerate the kind of immaturity of somebody who comes here and then pretends that they tried to engage with us in good faith when they didn't. Alberta Premier Daniel Smith, always appreciate the time. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, my pleasure. Okay, we have a quick clarification there. This comes from Daniel Smith's office that we received after that interview. A spokesperson for the Premier 
says they received a text that the Prime Minister was visiting the day before his event in Edmonton. It's unclear how many hours before the Prime Minister landed in Alberta that message was sent, but six hours may not be completely precise.